This episode of the Mix Minus Podcast is brought to you by Big League Pillows. You can find Big League Pillows at bigleaguepillows.com. The mission of Big League Pillows is to encourage little and big kids to envision and hold on to their dreams. Whether your child wants to be a pro athlete, a teacher, or a doctor, what better way for your sports fan to drift off to sleep than cuddling a symbol of hard work, passion, and fun? Every Big League pillow is a -a one-of-a-kind, just like your MVPs. You select the team, colors, city, and featured name. Your personalized Big League pillow will arrive in its very own locker box and also include a motivational draft letter to add to the excitement for your littlest or biggest fan. Big League pillows can be a gift for all occasions. Big League pillows are 100% premium polyester fill, 100% soft velvet polyester cover. They're made in the USA in a family-run facility. They're washable. They're about 16 inches tall and 12 ounces in weight. They're great. I have a couple for my son, Liam. Um, They're very comfortable and they're very nicely made, very high quality, handmade, and they're not even that crazy price. They're about $40. They're really cool. You can get all kinds of sports and styles. And from there, you pick that. You pick your style. And then you put on the name you want on the back of the jersey, on the front of the jersey. And you pick your number. And that will be sent to you again in the locker box with a congratulatory draft letter for coming on board with Big League Pillows. Again, go to bigleaguepillows.com. Let's jump into the episode. Hey guys, how you doing? Matt McQueenie here, Mix Minus Podcast. It is, what is today? My watch sometimes doesn't turn on. Saturday, April 7th, about 2.20 in the afternoon. Here we are in April, we think things are getting warm, and there are still these snow dustings popping up. I had a little bit of a snow dusting here in Sparta yesterday. There's some threats still out there. They're trying to wring out every last bit of snow. They, I don't know who they are because the weather is not controlled by someone, I don't think so. But, um... Hopefully this is it. April, we look ahead, we start getting warmer. Our days are long. Baseball's here. Basketball, NBA playoffs are here. And it's a joyous time as we get into the warmer weather. It's almost more joyous than the summer itself. The anticipation of summer is almost better. The months leading up to summer where you can think about what summer is going to mean and being this nostalgic entity, um, even though it doesn't tend to stack up. I always had a funny thing growing up because my birthday is July 13th. So I'm smack dab in the middle of summer. Kids were never around for birthday parties. So I was always just celebrating with my family, which is great. But you kind of left, you kind of felt like you were left out there on your own. So I always have my birthday to look forward to. But you kind of always have that feeling of the anticipation being better than uh, the actual eventuality of summer. Well, I'll tell you what, I've been talking about cord cutting for a while now. I've been talking about it intensely for the last couple of months as I have demoed YouTube TV and I have not let it go yet. I will not let go of that $35 a month plan I have. On March 13th, it jumped up to $40 a month, which is still not a bad price, but I've kept it around because I wanted to be at that lower, um, that lower number, that lower monetary number. And uh, I have found the service to be so unbelievably useful for me, even having cable in my house still. uh, We have a cable box on our main television in the living room, and then we have a standard definition cable box in the basement where we have a nice sectional couch from my parents' house, and uh, or originally from my parents' house, and we have our gym down there, so that TV gets a little bit of use there. But we almost never use that cable box. And so I got a little bit of a of a cable aspect in my house. Again, that main TV is the big one where, where you watch a lot of the different sports events on the big 60-inch TV, which I've had for about five years now. But I've been very much on the cusp here. And I've been talking about the fact that the Mets were the only thing that were really holding me with, with my local cable provider because there was no way to see the Mets uh, on a streaming service. Well, I'll tell you what, last Sunday... I, was, uh, I wasn't even aware this had happened, but last Sunday, put my little guy down to nap, and then often I'll go into my bedroom and just kind of lay on the couch, well, not the couch, lay on my bed for a moment, fire up the iPad, just resettle yourself, a little relaxation for a couple minutes before you have to do 
all the other things you do in life that are not being a father or a husband, like podcasting, like writing my articles, like doing a lot of my side gigs I do. Uh, there's no rest for the wary, but you get a couple of moments when you're on your bed there where you can kind of look at some things. So I fired up the YouTube TV. Um, I knew I wanted to watch the Mets game. You're, you're so intent on wanting to watch your baseball team when that season starts, when the newness and the novelty are there. And you just want to see how things are going. And the Mets have started out very well. Uh, they're about 5-1, and one, I think, now, or 6-1. and one. They're doing very well, playing up to their potential that we were all hoping. Baseball season is very long, so what happens in April doesn't necessarily augur anything for the rest of the season, and health has always been an issue with these Mets, but I like what I'm seeing from their new manager, Mickey Calloway. He has, he's only 42 years old, but he has one of these names that feel like a 1930s sports character. Hey, Mickey Calloway here, um, but it's been nice to see, and because they've been so good and they've lived up to the hype early on, I really want to be able to see them, and again, cable was the only way I could do that, but I fired up this YouTube TV on that Sunday, laid down, and I went, oh my God, in the top left corner where uh, the YouTube TV has the picks for you, which is something I really think is an important aspect of it, this whole idea of digitally servicing you with content. Uh, We're used to seeing it in the Netflixes of the world where they serve up the content you will want to see front and center, Um, not not in a sort of linear channel uh, two, three, four, five, six going down, which has nothing to do with you. It's just a rote kind of listing of channels. The digital services show you what you're going to want to see in a different kind of um, orientation. And so for whatever reason, Google knows I'm a Mets fan. I'm sure I search a lot. I'm sure I, uh, I have pixels somewhere that show that I visit the Mets site or I visit the their content on different news websites. But there it was, top left corner, I see the New York Mets playing, and I said, oh my God, what the hell is going on here? How are the Mets on? Is this a Channel 11 thing? Is this a MLB Network thing? And I looked deeper, and it said SNY, and I went, oh my God, how about this for a service? YouTube has the heft to be able to pull this off. They have the money. They can just buy up all the channels, and that was my thought. Just buy everything up. Who cares? Get everybody into your service. Be a loss leader if you have to. Uh, subsidize the losses, because you have all this money. If you want people on your service... Do it. Just get everything. Don't give people a reason uh, to not want to sign up with you. And for me, it was SNY. I could not cut it because a baseball season is long, 162 games, and probably at this point, 95% of them are on that one local regional channel. For the Mets, that is SNY. Uh, Sure, there are some games, ESPN, there might be some on local television, Fox, Channel 11 here and there, but for the most part, it is SNY, that is their network. And I would notice that for a long time, because it's day after day, you would notice uh, the, the fact that you don't have it. And so I needed it, and I fired this up, and I said, oh my God, there it is, SNY is there. No huge announcement, no... Uh, you know, no big fireworks, no alerts. And I just said to myself, oh my God, is this legit? And even though I saw it with my own eyes, I had to go to Twitter and I had to search SNY YouTube TV. And I saw probably a dozen people who went, wow, what a present here. The Mets and SNY are on YouTube TV. Now the word did ultimately come out a little bit through email and through little drips and drabs of content, but YouTube TV, who is servicing uh, all of America, when they had a regional sports network, even though it is as Uh, important locally as the Mets SNY channel, they're probably not going to make an enormous deal about it like they did when they added um, the TBS and the Turners and all that stuff. That was a big global announcement. But there were the Mets and I went, wow, I got it all here now. I think it's time to cut the cord. I really do think it's time. And actually another good piece of news was that SNY, pretty much at the same time, made deals with DirecTV Now, made deals with other streaming services. They're on this service. Fubo TV might be the service that is the um, underestimated uh, competitor in this market. I don't know what Fubo TV is about. I think there's almost a Latino aspect to it somehow. But this is a real uh, entrant and competitor in this market. See, Fubo TV will give you all the local sports. They have all the MSGs as well. So I couldn't see the Knicks. I couldn't see the Devils, the Rangers, the Islanders. I don't want to see a lot of those anyway. But um, 
just knowing you have them is a big deal. I like being able to put the Knicks game on when it looks like they're going to be pretty good in a year, even though it can all fall apart. See what Chris Stapp's Porzingis is up to. See how the team's uh, performing. It's always fun to see other teams come into Madison Square Garden and having that local exclusivity to it is an important thing. So uh, YouTube TV does not have MSG, but I bet you MSG is going to come to YouTube TV. YouTube TV is just going to continue. Google is just going to continue, I think, to buy up the channels, well, not to buy up, but to, to make uh, licensing agreements and deals with the channels to be on their um, on their service. I, I think it's it's an obvious thing here, but I, I love YouTube TV, and I think I'm going to cut the uh, cable. I love the DVR feature too, this unlimited DVR. When I'm at home and I have my cable, or I've had my cable the whole time, I'm not going to waste the DVR, which I think has about 50 hours of uh, HD content, which you can record. I'm not just going to waste it by recording the Mets game, recording the Yankee game for my wife. And of course, when you're uh, watching those, you can only have two things concurrently recording and you can't watch a third thing if you're recording two things. So it's a bit of a pain. Um, there's a lot of restrictions in, in place there. That's one piece with cable that just annoys you. They never innovated. And that might be the thing that does them in ultimately as services like YouTube TV and Fubo TV and direct TV. Now, as those services come to the fore and give customers exactly what they're looking for in the ways they're looking for on the types of platforms they're looking for for them. So my wife and I especially don't get to see the beginnings of games ever because our son starts his bedtime progression. uh, And I do call it a progression and a process because it will start anywhere between seven and seven 15, whether it's a bath night or not Um, bath nights, you get up there a little earlier because you got to move through. And this routine can last 45 minutes to an hour because you got to do the bath. You got to negotiate with the teeth. You got to do all the different uh, medicines he might need. You have to do potty. You have to get him into his pajamas. Um, You have to read anywhere from five to 15 books and uh, keep him, uh, you know, kind of keep him uh, watching and and paying attention and wanting to be a part of it. And uh, you just got to negotiate with a lot of that. And then bedtime ends up being a long uh, potential part of this where you have to do two and three walks even after you put him in the crib. And we do still have him in a crib because it's working out. He makes us do this thing called upside down man where he uh, kind of makes a yoga, like a downward dog position. And then you have to pick him up by the hips and put him into his crib upside down. Um, and sometimes you have to do that two times as you do several walks. So it's a long process. And by the time you come out of that process, uh, because the other piece is we have to keep his door open until he falls asleep. That's another part of the negotiation. As I say, negotiating with toddlerists, it's an intense process. And so we will put him down and then it's often 830 by this point. Um, and then we're eating between 8.30, 8.45, sometimes closer to 9 because we don't want to make a lot of noise to keep them up. It's it's a crazy world we live in. Um, <clears throat> I've actually been discussing with my wife. I think i got to find a way to eat before. I hate eating after. I like it on Friday nights when you're going to enjoy a bottle of wine and then some. Uh, you have a nice dinner. <clears throat> you don't have to be up early the next day. I like that. I like it on the weekends. But during the week, I don't want to extend the night with dinner and chores. You will be eating at the earliest by 830. And then it's nine before you're then cleaning up. And then you got to put things together for school and my wife's little chores that she needs for uh, food for, for work the next day and cleaning up stuff, cleaning up the living room where he uh, where he undid the cleanup throughout the day. You got to clean his cups and his plates and all that stuff. And then before you know it, it's 930. And you're not watching anything. You're not settling in. You're not relaxing. And before you know it, it's 945. My wife gets up very early during the week because she likes to do her workouts in the week every morning. I give her a lot of credit. I can't do that. I fall apart if I have to work out every day. So before you know it, she's getting a little tired, a little yawny. And she goes, why don't we just go up and watch something? And then you're in bed. And it's 10.05, 10.10, you're in bed, and we'll watch five minutes of Stranger Things, then she'll fall asleep, and then I'll watch something else, and then rinse and repeat. There you are, you wake up the next day, here you are again. So I need a little more downtime, relaxation time, uh, television time. Television's important. It's not just a passive thing that you're watching that makes you, uh, you know, that kind of pacifies you. 
TV for me is an active thing. If I'm not keeping up with these shows I love, and there are so many, what were there, almost 500 original television shows released in 2017, I believe. Crazy numbers, and maybe 10% of them I want to see. I'm very interested in them, and that's like 50, 50 shows. Each of them have 10, 13 uh, episodes. Some of the ones that are maybe on network TV have 22, 24. I don't watch those as much. More of the 10, 13 episode shows. It's a lot of hours of television that I'm not watching. There's documentaries, there's sports, there's movies. Not seeing a lot of it. So <clears throat> that's an important part of my life, consuming um, content uh, for both what I do on my podcast, for what I do in life. I enjoy keeping up with television shows, talking about them, recommending them, Um, getting recommendations from other people, having sort of a a common platform to discuss things. So it's important. So I really want to get back to eating before putting him down because then you put him down and you're not under fire about needing to get food and the night is slipping away. You know he's down. You can just jump into right what you're going to do uh, or jump right into what you're going to do. And so I'm really trying to get there. But in the time we are doing this, East Coast games will start around 7, 7, 10, 7, 30, uh, between basketball. Baseball seems to be 7, 10. And so if by the time you're getting to putting something on and it's 8, 30, you might be halfway through a baseball game. And sure, it's fine to drop in and the, the game as you're watching it will get you up to date on what happened in the early innings. But you're not getting the true extent of maybe what the starting pitchers are doing, what the, uh, what the lineup is doing early in games. And you don't want to use up that uh, what feels like a pretty limited DVR, this old storage device, these old cable boxes. You don't want to use up that DVR space on an HD program uh, for something as transient as a baseball game in the night, right? I mean, three hours, four hours of a game. And then if you're recording the Yankees for my wife too, that's eight hours of content. It's wiping away all other stuff. Now, we do not record almost anything anymore on our DVR for our own use. We record a lot of kids shows for my son's use for when, especially when he's being watched during the week by my mom, by Melanie's mom, by our nanny, so that they can fire up that DVR and watch one of the shows, um, you know, between when they're watching him and he eats and he goes to bed and through his routines. But, um, you know, it's, it uses up a lot of space. And so you almost end up never recording because, You just don't feel like it's worth the trouble. But when you have this YouTube TV, you can record everything. You record as many things as you want at one time. It doesn't matter. Your only limitation is you can only store up to nine months of stuff. That's a lot of time. I'm not going to need to watch a baseball game in nine months. Um, And if there's no consideration for how much storage is being used up, I just, I have it record. And Google, uh, YouTube TV only gives you the ability to record everything. You can't just record one episode of something or... Uh, one, well, you can record one game because <clears throat> those are considered events, but um, you can't just like record an episode of something. And as they say, who cares? There's no storage limits. So just take our word for it. Just record everything. And so I have a million. The one thing I do record is Sports Center. I did like when I could only record one because now I'll have a queue of like 150 Sports Centers per week because how, how often Sports Center is on is crazy. There's like seven in the morning and then there's ones at night and it's, crazy, but I just don't get too focused on it because there's the storage. It's no cost to me. It doesn't matter. But I record the Mets. <clears throat> Every Mets game comes on. I record it. And so what happens is by the time 830 rolls around, you come down, maybe you set your iPad up. Maybe I lay in bed for a couple minutes and I could just start the game from the beginning. And then I can fast forward through everything, scrub through it. And it's great. So you're watching everything from the beginning and then you're finishing the game around the time when it finishes anyway. Because once you've you know moved through the commercials, you move through the downtime, there you are. So that has actually been a great aspect of the YouTube TV. And it's the fact I don't have to watch it on that main television. I can just watch it on my device, any device. Um, and as I said, six people can be, can or three concurrent um, feeds can be playing, I believe is what it is. But six people can have accounts. So I can have my own DVR of what I'm recording. My wife can have her own. And then we can create four others. I'm thinking of if I go with this cord cutting to get around the whole personalization thing I talked about where I don't want the, um, or I don't want the interests of the people watching my son during the week. I don't want what they watch to affect the algorithms that are showing the content I want on my account. I might, I might just create a living room account 
so that that's the open account that can just be used when people are there during the day. And that'll just be the default login that's on. And then if I ever take over that TV at night, I can just switch back to mine, watch it there, and then you know switch it back to the living room account um, when I'm done with it. So I'm kind of thinking about that because when you have six slots, I don't even. I could give everybody their own, but they would never know. Um, the middle-aged women, the older women in my uh, house during the week would not know how to switch over to those other services. And my other worry too is sometimes the Apple TV will be a little funny. And like, you'll open up the YouTube TV app and it'll kick you right back out to the main index of the Apple TV. You open it up, kicks you right back out. And often that's because the Apple TV needs a reboot. Sure. You could, you could, um, unplug it, plug it back in. You could go and, uh, you could go to the settings and shut it down, shut it back up. But that starts to get a little intense. Those things never happen with the cable box. That's the only thing I have said it before hashtag cable is stable. It doesn't have those issues. But I think when I look at this, if I go to cut the cable, first of all, I'm going to have to up my internet. Right now I have 20 megabits per second, which is decent um, internet. But when you're going all in on that being your television platform, it's going to be on all the time. Um, At that number, if you have another computer online, if my wife's on her phone, if I'm on my phone, you start to get some pixelation on the feed at times. And so... um, I think I have to bump up for that reason. I could bump up to 30 megabits per second, and that's about $8 more, but I think I'm going to have to bump up to 70 megabits, which will end up being, if I cut cable and I cut the phone, it's going to end up being $93 a month. That's a good amount of internet, though. So it'll be be, uh, about $93 a month plus the $35. I'm looking at saving about $50 a month, and that's $600 a year. That's decent enough where it might be worth it. And I just like the service better. I mean, I'm probably watching uh, live television or DVR live television. I'm probably watching it mobile um, probably 75% of the time. So um, if, if it's only 25% of the time I'm on my TV there watching it, I mean, I, I, gotta, I gotta stay with that because I'm not watching the TV with the cable box barely at all anyway. So, um, you know, and even when you think about Tomorrow, I could just record the whole Masters. Um, I could record. Uh, I can record all the games going on. It doesn't matter. It's just all open to you. There's no worries. Now, the only thing that does stink is I was recording 60 minutes for the Stormy Daniels interview last week and the Giannis Antetokounmpo uh, interview, and I do have that always recording. The one thing YouTube TV has to get good at is the whole aspect of when you have something leading up to the show you want to watch, like a sporting event that it will bleed over into that and you end up, I think it was the final four. No, maybe it was the sweet 16 or elite eight and the game was, the game went long. And then by the time 60 minutes started, the, the expectation of the recording was way over. So I didn't end up being able to see that um, because Google hasn't quite figured that part out where you can add time to the end. So I guess the thing I would have to do in that case is to record the 60 minutes and then record the show that's after it. So it can pick it up. But then the problem with that is what if the show after it is one I don't like. And now that show is just going to always be recording. Cause as I said, YouTube TV will record everything. First world problems. Um, I like this. I kind of like the idea that I'll be paying under a hundred dollars for my, what was my triple play and I'll have very high level internet and I could stream with 70, you could probably have several concurrent streams going on. And that's, that's key. Cause I will run into some things where it does start to pixelate a little. And I just don't think I have enough internet for that. Cause I think this does use somewhere around eight to 13 megabits, um, on the download to watch Netflix can be like three or five based on the definition. But for whatever reason, maybe this is just because it's live television. It's just using up more bandwidth. So I need to get more, but I think I'm going to do it. I think it's going to be fun. So yeah, SNY is on. I wouldn't be surprised if more networks just come on as YouTube TV gains steam and continues to, and then Amazon starts throwing all this leftover money it just has hanging around. It can just throw towards licensing deals to get more channels. Don't know why Apple didn't pull this off. Apple, they're missing the boat with that. Unless maybe they're not. Maybe they're they're fine monetarily. I mean, we know they are, but I don't know why they didn't go all in with this um, as YouTube TV is on their service doing it. Um, it's very, very strange. So another crazy thing, I told you 
Well, I had remarked that uh, on a podcast maybe one or two ago that I heard things in the walls. <laughs> And I'm not paranoid. I actually heard things in the walls running around and stuff. And look, I live way out in the country. There's mice. There's all kinds of stuff. They're not actually in the house, but they're on the periphery. Uh, There's some mice action that happens in the attic. These roofs um, in our neighborhood and a lot of the houses that are built like this have a lot of sort of weird angles in their roofs where one's coming down, one's coming up. And there's some seams that I think will open up that mice can exploit. They're very small. And we've had mice and we have a really good extermination company. They come around twice a year. I have the subscription plan that allows them to do that. Um, this, they'll come anytime too. They don't worry. It's, it's a great service. They're called Cavanaugh's. Really enjoy them. I'm actually very fascinated by the exterminators themselves. It's amazing to talk to these guys. Every time they come over, I'm just like, I should fire up the microphone and just start talking to them. The stories they tell me are insane about what they run into, but we heard some stuff in the attic. So we had a, uh, we, we had one come an exterminator come to our house. He goes, Oh yeah, there were some mice here. So he set up some new traps. There's sort of a way of life here. It's just what it is. The mice come in and with these traps, they end up eating, um, the, whatever is in those traps, they eat it and then they run out and I guess it makes them ultra thirsty and they're not able to drink enough water to quench that. And they end up dying out in the field somewhere out in the, or out in the woods or out in the yard. So they don't, uh, they do end up dying upstairs too, but, um, they disintegrate real quick. It's very strange. Um, but he came and he put those in there and that was it. We did have a bat up there once and that, that was taken care of, but the mice were, you know, are handled pretty well. And then after he left for the next two weeks and look, we've had like so much snow lately. So there was a point where there was maybe like two or three feet of snow just sitting in the yard. And I don't know with little animals like this, but I'm guessing when there's that much snow, they don't, they can't even place themselves anywhere. So going into an attic is the best thing. And so I just thought they were mice. And I thought because of the snow, there was a lot of action upstairs just because of that. And my wife was just kind of losing it. So like when my wife would go to bed at night and you would hear, I would hear things upstairs. I would never tell her. I would just not tell her because I don't want to open up that can of worms uh, or open up that attic um, of mice, <laughs> a can of worm, an attic of mice. And so I just don't really talk about it. It's just part of the deal. It's okay. They move on. But she was hearing a lot of it and she would hear it. We'd wake up in the morning and it was enough where it was just driving her nuts. And I'm more of a passive guy. So I'm not that active about figuring that out. When I figured out we had things up there, I removed everything we had up there. Like we would keep our luggage up there because I was like, I'm just going to lock this up. I'm not going up there again. I don't need to be in that attic. Um, the only time I go up are the two times a year the exterminator comes and I make him go up first and then I follow. Could be a her, but it's always been a him. And so we were hearing this, hearing this, hearing this. And ultimately she's like, you got a call. So I called back again and they're like, all right, we'll send someone out uh, if you're hearing stuff. And I'm thinking, that's oh, just mice. What are we going to do about it? And it's just what it is. And so this guy shows up again, there's like three feet of snow on the yard and he, he's like, I'm going to walk around the yard and he's walking around the yard. He's like up to his waist in snow. It's insane how much snow we had, but we he comes in, we, we go upstairs, we go up to the attic. Uh, he walks up to the attic and then he goes, Oh, I saw one. I saw a flying squirrel and he came right back down. I'm like, wait, what are you doing? Isn't this your job? What do you mean? You saw one and you're freaked out. And so he just, you should have seen his eye. It was like, he, he got caught, turned right around, went right back down the little uh, ladder stairs or whatever from the pull down attic. And he's like, Oh, I saw one. He's like, I never see them. You never see them. He goes, when you see one, it means there's five or six for every one you see. And I was like, Oh, great. So I don't know if you've heard of flying squirrels, but they're little, they're like almost squirrel mice, like merged with a bat. So they fly. And what they tend to do is they climb up trees. They're a nocturnal animal as well. They got sort of beady little eyes. And that's what he was saying. He's like, I saw its beady little eyes before it ran. And I'm sitting here going, maybe I should have gone upstairs because I don't know if he's pulling one over on me because then you figure out or you find out that that's not covered in the plan. For whatever reason, flying squirrels are a different deal. It's a different package. You got to pay like five or six hundred dollars to have the flying squirrel thing taken care of because what you do apparently they find the place where they got in and then they create a one-way exit um so that the squirrels can go back out through it but then they're not able to get back in because it closes itself off and so he's like yeah we got to take care of that he's like i saw one 
so I know what I'm looking for. I'm the flying squirrel guy. Apparently, there's flying squirrel guys. There's different rodent specialties, I guess you would say. And so now he's going to have to come back. He's going to have to climb up the ladder, do all that. And my wife is freaked out because we have the snow. They can't come around because they got to be able to set up outside. They can't be in rain. They can't be in weather. And it'll be in like a week and a half later that they ended up coming. But this guy was telling me, he's like, yeah, these flying squirrels there, they're kind of crazy because they like to live in trees, um, but they can become very acclimated in attics. And he said, um, often, uh, there's two parts to this. So often what will happen is a tree might get knocked over in a weather event or something. And if there were flying squirrels living in that tree, now they're scurrying around looking for something. And they like to climb up trees and then jump from the trees to the roofs of houses. So sometimes at dusk, you'll see things flying around. You might think they're bats, but they're flying squirrels jumping from the tree to the roof. And then they'll go into the attics. And then if they set up shop there, he said the big problem is if they then have babies, because then the babies only know living in an attic. So if you get those babies when they become older... Uh, uh, you know, uh, if you set up that thing with the one way exit and those babies leave as adults, they don't know how to live in the natural world. They only know how to live in attics. So those babies as adults then go looking for the next addicts because that's all they know how to do. It's almost like addicts, right? Um, so they go to the next house and he says, often when flying squirrels are taken care of in one house, they then just move on to another house or if a tree's knocked down, they move on to another house. So it's this whole crazy game and now, now we're a part of it. He was also telling me one crazy thing that, uh, there was a, 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 an insane flying squirrel situation in this house somewhere in Sussex County up here. So there was sort of a, a guy who I guess lived in a wheelchair and maybe had some help. Uh, or lived with other people. I forget what it was, but it was a three story house with then an attic, you know, as the fourth story, I guess you'd say. So because of the certain level of disability, these, this group had, they never went above the second floor. So they would never hear things because often you hear it. And that's how you know to have someone come and look at it. If it sounds like, I mean, there were points for the record, it sounded like deer were running upstairs, like Santa, uh, like Santa Claus and the reindeer had showed up. It was loud. It was like crazy sized animals were running around up there. And so you'll hear that and that'll be the cue to get someone to come. So because these people never left the second floor of this house, when above that, they never heard anything. The poor cable guy comes because the cable's not working in the house anymore. And as I discussed in the earlier part of this, you expect satellite, you expect internet to have some issues. You never expect cable because cable is like, is like a preferred tier internet. If you think about it, you know, when you think about that cable hooking right into the cable box, we never think of it like internet, but it's really like a preferred highway of internet where, uh, the cable service is being delivered and only that is being delivered on a certain pathway to show on your TV. And so it never really goes down. Cable pretty much is always up, never an issue with cable. And so this house where they don't go above the second floor, the cable was funky. So what do they do? They don't think of anything. They call cable. The cable company shows up. The cable guy shows up. Uh, the cable was routed through the attic. So this guy had to go up past the, you know, that second floor. They never leave, went up to the third floor, climbed up into the attic the frickin' guy saw 10 flying squirrels when he was trying to fix the cable. I think they had chewed up the cable. And so back to my math, when I was talking to my exterminator, the guy who ended up taking care of this house and who took care of ours, who saw the one, and he goes, you never see one. And uh, because that means there's five or six. This cable guy, who's not an exterminator, saw 10 flying squirrels. So you times that by five or six, and uh, the numbers get bigger. It's a crazy magnification. And the exterminator told me when they went to take care of that house, they cleared something like 144 flying squirrels. Holy crap. I am totally fascinated with the exterminators. I'd love to do like an exterminator podcast. It would make everybody want to get the service. Speaking of service, speaking of fascinating things, I went to see Black Panther was it last, maybe two weeks ago or last week? I'm losing touch with time as I always do. I finally saw Black Panther after everybody saw it like a month or two before. Black Panther was playing in my local theater here in the little theater I love below the Panera 
in the middle of downtown, downtown Sparta. Watch out. There is no uptown. But um, I wanted to see it there because I love being able to go to that theater. I love that it's close. And uh, by the time I was ready to see it, it had been pulled from the theater. And it was there a long time. It was there like two months, I feel like. So I went down to Rockaway Mall, uh, the AMC Rockaway, which is a big, big theater with all of the bells and whistles. And I went to see Black Panther. I loved it. I got to use Movie Pass too, for the first time. And it really worked out well. So um, by the time I got into the ring around the mall there, the ring around the posy, um, I was able to then be presented with the check-in. So I was able to check into the movie. Uh, I parked and I walked in. And by the time I went to buy my ticket, um, I was able to use that debit card that they give you from movie pass and it worked seamlessly. I was very worried it wasn't going to work. It just doesn't feel right. It feels like you're being conned, but it totally worked. And I went in and, uh, I enjoyed the movie very much. I am not a huge superhero guy. I say that every time. And then I go on to talk about the superhero thing I saw. I like a lot of those Marvel series on Netflix. I think they're fantastic. Um, but the movie aspect I've not been as into, Um, although I did see Logan last year and that ended up being the Oscar discussion, which was good, but black Panther, there was so much buzz about it. There was so much discussion that it was more than a superhero movie, which is what you want to hear. You want to go see a good movie with a good story, uh, with intelligence and, uh, with a, with a larger narrative behind it. And boy, did this deliver. This was a phenomenal movie. There's a reason it's done so well. Um, and it's actually been one of the movies, they often say African American movies, movies based around African Americans. And in this movie, it was based around Africans actually too. I guess you could say movies, uh, that, that feature black people, um, prominently, they don't do well internationally, but I think that's been turned on its head this year. When you think of get out, how well that movie did. And then you think of black Panther, it's going around the world doing phenomenal. It's a great movie. And what it was, it's a, it's like a technological future with African characteristics. Almost like they always say China, um, it's, it's like a democracy with Chinese characteristics or whatever. You know, they bring the specific aspects of that culture to bear on what they're trying to present. And it did a very good job of that. Um, it's, it's sort of this, I mean, we've, uh, many of us have seen the movie, but there's this kind of mythological land in a modern culture in the middle of Africa, in the heart of Africa. And it's a, it's a, a society called Wakanda and whether people don't believe it's more than what you see in the heart of Africa, um, or because they do a good job of hiding it, nobody in the outside world really sees it. And this culture is built on this, um, <clears throat> this mineral called vibranium. And it basically uh, fuels this future technology that they have. It's this, they're able to mine it at the highest levels and they keep it deep within the heart of this African society. It doesn't get out. It's not used by any other people. Um, Only the people who live in this society are able to benefit from this. Um, And this Wakanda, it is all African folks. Um, So all, pretty much all a black culture. And, um, it's just, it was a tremendous, I found it to be a tremendous movie. Uh, it was very stimulating. It was very good. It got you thinking about things in different ways. Um, there was a point where they were talking about not ever wanting to let people in to their, uh, into their cosseted world. They didn't want to let outsiders in cause it would, it would wreck what they have. And it was crazy because I'm sitting there watching them talk about that. And I said, wow, I totally agree. And then I said, wait a second that's making you think and flip on your head the idea of mass or not even mass migration, but immigration about the, we hear these same things from nationalists that we can't let people in. They're going to ruin what we have. And I reflexively say, no way they create a, a melting pot, which we can all benefit from. You bring in outsiders and they make everything, uh, they add to the mix. They don't pull from the mix. And then as I'm hearing these characters talk about that in the sense of Wakanda, I'm like, yeah, I agree. And so it really made you think intensely. It went right to your gut, went right to your brain, uh, went right to your heart. It was, it was very, uh, very thought provoking. The other one was, um, Michael B. Jordan is in this kind of as the, the, the nemesis, the bad guy. But when you come to see his story, you realize maybe he's not the bad guy, but he was just brought up in a situation that he had nothing to do about. And he went along a path 
um, where he was cultured over 20, 25 years that led him to being a villain. And that really we all start from the same places and it's the paths we take and it's the uh, outside influences that are brought upon us that, that lead us to where we are. And maybe we have deep down a predilection to go in one direction or another, but maybe we really don't as well. So it made you think about what is good, what is bad, who is right, who is wrong. Um, and I know all superhero movies do that, but this one just did it at a different level. And so this Michael B. Jordan character, uh, his name was Killmonger. And there's a point where he comes back to Wakanda. He finds his way back there, which is his life's goal. Uh, cause his father had been killed, um, in a roundabout way. Um, there, it, it, it's kind of interesting, but, uh, like any nation, Wakanda sends out what are in in essence spies around the world to kind of keep up with world events to report back to the mainland. Um, and so <clears throat> the character who plays Michael B. Jordan's father is played by Sterling Brown, who of course was Christopher Darden in, uh, the, the people versus OJ Simpson. He's Randall in this is us a tremendous, tremendous actor. And so he plays the character who's a spy. He's also the brother of the King. And, um, he, he, as he goes out to the world in the nineties to spy, he ends up in, uh, Northern California, Oakland, and he really takes on the black power movement. And he wants to take what is this mineral that they have in Wakanda and to lift up the oppressed African Americans to use this to kind of, uh, put his finger on the scale to rebalance society with this, with this, um, with this mind material that only Wakanda has. And because of that, he gets too far into that world and he ends up losing his, uh, he ends up losing his life. And so now the son he had, who was a young kid playing basketball on the court outside of this, uh, low income housing is now a kid without a father. And he knows his history because his father's from Wakanda. So he technically has a right to Wakanda. He has a right to be, he is a Wakandan. And so the King ends up, dying, I think in a bombing and his son, uh, takes over as the new King of Wakanda. And in this world, uh, when one is to become a new King, they can be challenged by any of the, I think it's five or six other tribes who live in Wakanda. And, um, I think most of the time, maybe someone will not challenge. They will understand that that is the person who has the right to the throne. But, uh, there's a scene where one of the, one of the tribes who lives far off in the mountains, almost like in, in, um, in some ways it's almost like, uh, the people who live beyond the wall in game of Thrones or something. And so they come down and that the leader of that tribe, uh, uh challenges this to be King to, uh, to a fight. The King vanquishes, vanquishes them. And that's that he wins. But what happens is Michael B. Jordan's character, Killmonger comes back to Wakanda, finds his way back. And he is sort of a uh, he is sort of a super villain. He's become this <clears throat> war veteran who was almost like a high level sniper, a lot of kills in his life, avenging his childhood, his parent, you know, everything was leading to getting himself back. And he became this, this truly, um, th- this force to be reckoned with. And so when he shows up back in Wakanda, it's interesting because he has as much a right as anybody to the throne. Uh, and it made me feel like the whole Donald Trump thing. Um, Donald Trump has every right to be the president of America, but is he right? Um, it, does he have what it takes? Is he best for everybody? Uh, a lot of that doesn't matter. And it's up to the populace to decide, uh, if that person should be in control and, uh, to vote him in. And as long as he's a, he's a rightful citizen, he can step up to run as much as anybody. And so when this killmonger, Michael B. Jordan character comes back to Wakanda, um, people realize that maybe they want this, this real, uh, warlike figure, this, this person who's not going to take Wakanda and keep it this hidden entity, but is actually going to take the force of the society out to the world and conquer, um, and, and, and overtake other countries by force. And with this vibranium, you could overtake the world. It's a, it's a true, um, it, it's a, it's a real privilege to have this. Like it's the most important element in the world. Um, and it could really, <clears throat> could do quite a bit of damage. Uh, some might say damage, some might be, say it brings up the oppressed peoples of the world. And so when he wins, it felt like Donald Trump winning. 
and it was crazy that there's this King's guard, right? And, and the leader of the King's guard, they're all female is the woman who plays Michonne in walking dead. And of course she has a weapon in this as well that she is able to, um, manipulate very well. And so when this killmonger ends up vanquishing T'Challa, who was the King who's when his father died and is the cousin of killmonger in the end, um, when he takes over, it's interesting the way the King's guard says we are, um, you know, we are, uh, loyal to the throne, not necessarily, not necessarily to one person. And that's how it is. Trump takes over. You hate the fact that the people who work with him and for him, who have been there from past administrations, who are always career servants, that they're loyal to that person. It's kind of an interesting situation, but it is a movie that I will probably, if I saw it come on, I would watch it again. I think it's that good. It was very good. Speaking of Trump, I saw um, a Netflix documentary. I don't know what made me want to watch this because I was. it wasn't even first up in the uh, recommendations. I had to swipe through and I saw this, this documentary called Trump and American Dream. I was very drawn to it and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a four-part series. Each of the parts are somewhere around 40 to 50 minutes to maybe an hour. And it takes you through about four to five decades of his life from when he was in his 20s um, and even younger interspersed into the story from his 20s up until today. I've seen three of the four parts. I am totally um, I'm totally hooked on this thing. This this documentary is really, really good. Uh, A lot of stuff that I never knew about Donald Trump. And I know a lot. But see where Donald Trump was before. he was, it was like, you never wanted, you never needed to go deep on Donald Trump through the decades because he wasn't critical to your life. He was fun. He was tabloid. He was entertaining. Um, he had all the wives, he had all this, like none of that was that germane to your life. None of it was that important. The minute he became president, now you see this all through a different visage. You see it all through a different view. And when you watch it, you're just completely uh, you're just completely fascinated with the way this guy was able to ascend to the throne that is the American presidency. And just to see all these little stories through his life, his wives, um, all these people that are talked to in the documentary, a lot of interviews. And I think the most interesting part of this is it's a British-based documentary. So you kind of see it. It's very neutral. I mean, I actually found myself watching it early on, rooting for Donald Trump in a way. This guy who was able to overtake... Manhattan real estate in a way as a complete outsider from not much. Uh, sure. He got some money help from his father. He was able to start, you know, some will say at third base, maybe second base, but his dad was a major like outer boroughs developer and lower income developer. And Donald Trump came in and became a premium developer in Manhattan and was able to get tax abatements and was able to convince people to allow him with outside money to build some of the largest Let's be honest, ornate, beautiful buildings that you could, very tall buildings. He actually owns, um, I don't know if it's still the case, but I saw in the documentary, he owns a pretty large stake in the Empire State Building. Um, he did a lot that's really, really impressive. Now, he's done it in an interesting way, if you want to use that word. He's been very, um, he gets very warlike. And I think once he became president, it changed everything about how you view his past. But he came from an interesting spot in his twenties and he overtakes and gets into Manhattan real estate in a very big way. Um, and there are some bad moments, but it was, I like to see eighties. I like to see eighties, New York and early nineties, New York. And there's the technology is not as ubiquitous, obviously as it is today. And it's just a different society. When you go back 20, 30 years, when technology was not in the palm of our hands, it was just a different feel. Um, and even watching the news interviews, it was strange. It felt like state, run media, the way they were interviewing Donald Trump. And, um, even when you go back to his interviews, when he was in his late twenties, early thirties, it was something, uh, it, it's a very, very compelling documentary. Some of the parts that I never even realized, um, and how would I, I was a little kid at the time, but, um, <clears throat> one of the things that was kind of impressive was, uh, uh, mayor Ed Koch was tasked, his government was tasked with rebuilding the rink in Central Park. I forget what the name was. It? I forget the name of it, but rebuilding it. And like a sort of big dig type of 
type of uh, uh, undertaking, it wasn't getting done and it was constantly behind schedule and, and over budget and it just wasn't moving ahead. And Donald Trump, where his office was, he was able to look out on where this rink was and it drove him so nuts that he decided, I'm going to take it over. I'm going to grandstand this and I'm going to get it done. And he ended up getting this thing done, I think in two months, he was able to do it without any money coming in from the, from the, from the city or the state or anything, any entity. And I mean, he ended up, it sounded like screwing the developer who helped him do it or the uh, builder, but he got it done and he got it done in two months. And that was something that was interesting. Um, his first wife, Ivana, the power he gave her to run the Atlantic City casinos, and she did a great job. And then he ended up giving her the ability to run the Plaza Hotel. I didn't realize he had bought the Plaza Hotel as well. And it, it gave me a different thought on when he shows up in Home Alone 2, because that's the Plaza Hotel. That's why he was in it, because he's randomly in it. And you're just like, what the heck is Donald Trump doing in Home Alone 2? But you come to find out that he pretty much bought the Plaza Hotel because he was having an affair with Marla Maples and he wanted her to be in Atlantic City. So he moved Ivana out to run the Plaza Hotel so that he could have his mistress in Atlantic City. And I don't know if it's true or not, but it looked like she did an unbelievable job running the Atlantic City, uh, the Trump Casino, I think it was. And the crazy part, how he ended up getting like three casinos in Atlantic City, building three, ending with the Taj Mahal, which really fell apart with the, uh, it kind of came out right after the 89 stock crash. Um, and whether that was the reason or not, or whether it was his ambitions of opening up too many casinos that took it down, who will ever know? But he brought Ivana up to run the Plaza Hotel so he could be with his mistress in Atlantic City. Wow. The other thing, when he was divorcing her, he had told a confidant of Ivana's that he can't sleep with a woman who has had kids. And the confidant said, but they're your kids. So I found that to be crazy. He can't sleep with a woman who has had kids. And I wonder if that one quote colors a lot of what you find out about his affairs is, I mean, he's having affairs anyway, but is there anything to that, that once someone he's with has kids, he has to have affairs with other women who don't have kids. Um, the other thing with the Atlantic city, I never knew this, that, um, and who knows if this had something to do with the failure or the six or the failure of the casinos when they all went under, but the three executives who ran his casino business, they went down in a helicopter right alongside the New the Garden State Parkway in Forked River, New Jersey. I didn't realize this. They needed to get back from New York where they did a press event for a boxing thing. That was another crazy thing that Donald Trump had the ambition to not only help to help to try to build up Atlantic City, I mean, for his own ends, but the fact that he brought big fights to Atlantic City and he put it on the map in a way that it maybe wasn't there uh, and brought celebrity and glitz to it and, and, and you know, all these people almost uh, descending on Atlantic City the way they would Las Vegas. That was kind of impressive. But yeah, these executives, they went down, um, uh, they had rented a helicopter. It wasn't even a Trump helicopter. Trump tried to say he was supposed to be on the helicopter, I think, to help his story a little bit, to make it look like he was in more of a uh, important position with this, to leverage the situation. But these executives, they, uh, they rented a helicopter to go from Manhattan back to Atlantic City, and it went down right alongside the Garden State Parkway. I had no idea about that. Um, it's, it's really, it, it, it's a compelling documentary. I don't know why for me, I wanted to press play, but I did. And I watched it and I can't stop watching it. I just got the one more piece, which is about his political career, obviously leading where it does. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good one. I would highly recommend it. Very good. Um, I was actually reading an interesting article in Harper's Magazine on Donald Trump. And the uh, crux of the article was, don't be surprised if he wins again. Uh, in the 2021, will it be 2021? I don't know whether, the, let's see. So he was... He was elected in, so he started in 2017, January 2017 was when he was brought in. So that would mean it'll be 2020, right? That's when the election will be. Don't be surprised if he wins. Uh, and it's it, uh, Harper's, which is more left of center for sure. Very much like a, like a little brother, New Yorker even though they've probably been around for the same amount of time, but the New Yorker has been able to ascend in this digital environment much better than something like Harper's, which is behind a paywall. But uh, they're kind of saying he has the pulse of a large enough subset of Americans and Americans that Democrats once spoke for, but are not speaking to still Democrats kind of keep waiting on Mueller to be the savior. 
It's almost like waiting on a fire drill to get you off the hook. And sometimes people pull the fire drill themselves to get off the hook or set off the sprinklers. Um, Is it possible, and this article kind of talks about this, but maybe it's getting into my own thinking, is it possible that Democrats are putting too much on Mueller to deliver them, to deliver them from evil? This Republican former FBI director, this discerning lawyer who's running this sprawling investigation, which will be probably one of the best Netflix series we ever see when it comes out or a movie. Um, but you know, we're waiting too much on it and, and have Democrats come around to figuring out what that, what that part of America that voted for Trump that we can't believe voted for Trump. Uh, and this article spares no, uh, insults when it talks about Donald Trump very truly, but he has the pulse. He figured out what is important to the middle of the country. I don't even want to just say the middle of the country to the swaths of the country who don't feel like they're spoken for. And no matter how much dysfunction is going on, no matter how many investigations are happening, he still might deliver what he promised to the country, which was higher wages and a good economy. And it was saying, uh, as a parallel to Bill Clinton, that Bill Clinton had, had so much going on. He was in impeachment proceedings and he still won. And it was because the economy was good and it looked like he was handling that and wages were going up. The other crazy thing from that Trump documentary, we all know, I think that we all, I think, know this, that uh, Ronald Reagan said, make America great again. But it was interesting the way Bill, uh, Bill Clinton, when they showed him that he said, make America great again. So we're kind of killing Donald Trump, making fun of him for this MAGA thing. Um, and sometimes you have to pull back from your, uh, your dislike of someone and, and realize if you're going after them, you got to realize you're just don't uh, reflexively go after them for every single thing they do, because at some point you're going to find an analogy to someone you liked doing something exactly the same thing or being the, um, or kind of, uh, or being the basis for which this person you don't like comes up with something. Everybody seems to have said MAGA. They just didn't say MAGA. They said, make America great again. So everyone seemed to use that. But uh, there's this idea that don't don't wait for some outside force to deliver uh, to deliver the electorate to a Democratic nominee. Donald Trump is fighting hard. He works hard on certain things. He works hard on his image. He works hard on how he's perceived, and he works hard on. And it might be um, in 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 kind of ways that don't seem like there's a lot of thought behind them. But he's potentially always working hard on things he promised because he hates looking bad. And even if he doesn't end up where he promised, he's going to work really hard uh, to get there to appear that he got there. And so I don't know. I'm very, uh, I'm very unsure that anybody has come along. That, look, Donald Trump's done his part. I think he has turned off a, a, a large enough portion of the electorate and hopefully enough of the electorate who voted for him will change. But if you don't have the change agent in place for all of the people who have moved off of him to put their hopes and fears into the, that vesicle, that vessel, I don't know where you're going to end up. And I think that's a worrisome aspect. Who is coming along on the democratic side to accept that anti-force that maybe Trump has brought forth. And if they don't, why won't he win? especially if he's off the hook in an indictment eventually, and then the economy's doing well, and maybe wages are going up uh, in, a, in a targeted sort of surgical strike that he might find a way to get the wages up in those places he needs to. Someone was saying, uh, or someone was saying, this article was saying that, watch the, and I think it just came out, that the Flint water is now clean. Isn't that interesting? In this time where Donald Trump's EPA is doing very harmful things to the environment, how does the Flint water get get fixed? How does that get cleaned? Hmm, that's a swing state. So he might surgically strike these places that he knows are swing states and do the right thing for them. And in the end of the day, isn't that what a politician does? He delivers for his constituents. He delivers for the part of the uh, part of society that he is standing for. And if you just need to win a certain percentage or a certain amount of votes more than the other side. If you can go and deliver to those people and they can swing it for you, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, uh, he might win again. And I'll tell you what, uh, I've gone back and forth on the Russia thing and whether Russia turned our election. Someone said 
Ted Cruz was using Cambridge Analytica or whichever, or, you know, uh, Donald Trump had to be the right person for the right time. Uh, because you put anybody else in charge, you put Ted Cruz in there, Marco Rubio in there. I don't know if, uh, if Russia can swing that they needed the breach, they needed the opening and they needed the right avatar for it all to work as we do in life. Everything's multi-pronged, everything's multifaceted, everything's dynamic and it all needs to come together at the right place and time. And it's funny when you watch this documentary, how Donald Trump, whether he's causing that wave or riding that wave, he's able to be in places at the right place at the right time. Usually when things bottom out and he can ride it back up in its natural evolution that he makes his hay. And I give him credit for that. He's done well with it. All right, guys. I think that's where we are. I appreciate you. And I will uh, talk to you soon. 